on the air. <laughs> Just a couple minutes beforehand. Let me get our clickety clack whoopity whoops going here. Our uh, welcome to Evolution Hour. Uh, here we are. Whoops. On the uh, day of the inauguration, which went off without a hitch. That's reassuring to know. And there's our little logo. Troubles in Paradise, Methodology of Creationism. Welcome to the show. It seems the Republic is functioning and we are proceeding accordingly. Let anybody in the live stream uh, pop up in the chat to know you're all there. Um, as usual, we are also doing the continuing replacing Darwin source by source. Hello, Lisa and Vesta. Hi, all. Hi, guys. Boop -doop. Hi, all. Uh, we got. Um, uh, where's our little. Oh. Um, we're into the cusp into chapter five of um, his book. And uh, he's continuing to slog along on the tail end of uh, phylogeny and how organisms are developing. Um, oops, something wrong. Try reloading the page. What page? Uh, stream is having connection issues. Yikes. Come on, come on, come on. It's still got, um, okay. It's like we're still operational. Um, probably 180 trillion people are on the. Uh, a zoom at this moment which is amazing because that's more than there are people on the planet but you know what can you do when you start cloning anyway i'll uh, as usual give you the basic skivvy about what's going on just in case we have a screw up on the connection so um replacing darwin nathaniel jensen a pompous creationist who's at the cutting edge of walking out on the gangplank in terms of how much of evolutionary data he's willing to accept and pretend that they've always accepted it. So we'll be discussing primates this time around and, and I'll be um, eventually posting uh, uh, some quotes and things from uh, him and also uh, a discussion of Joel Duff and his criticism of the very points that um, Jensen is trying to deal with. Uh, and then part two is going to be a bit on uh, standing for truth and raw math who apparently have accepted this snake fossil that Carl Baugh was offering that I strongly suspect is actually a piece of hadrosaur poop. But anyway, uh, that will be in, in the part two. So let me right off the bat uh, thank all the gang uh, who have been patrons of the project. Uh, our uh, colleagues, Hendrew and Colton, Eric Riley, Cyrus Zeshi, our researcher level, Travis Adams, Ian Chen, uh, Ian... Uh, convert me, Stephen Early, Neil, James Fitzwater, History Minor, Ralph McFadden, Apologia, Benjamin Simpson, Speed of Sound, our assistant researchers, Doranku, Tonus Real, and Christopher Johnson, our friend level, Daniel, Steve Bauman, geologist, Mary Gail Beddows, Insects Are Cool, Devin Miranda Reeves, Morton Nielsen, Paul the Skeptic, Buffalo Lepigus, Bo Hobo, Rasmussen, Alex Stone, Paul Williams, and legacy patrons who have helped at one point or another uh, that I'm so going to thank. Uh, Jen and Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew, Dyer, Yui, Mona, Brad, uh, Daniel, Nanya, Stagel, Sun, Sky, Stone, Ugly German Truths, Everett, and Sewer. Uh, you've all been helpful in one form or another, and so I'm very, very thankful of that. It allows me to keep flowing along one bit or another, working on various book projects. So, the best at least for Truth, Slade, Chimera, um, and whoever else is popping in, say um, uh, hi on it. So, uh, back to point number one. Uh, which is going through source by source uh, the material that Nathaniel Jensen thinks to present for the arguments that he does. Remember, you can do um, any argument you wish. You can make any sense of strings of statements. You can put footnotes in even. But the question is, do the footnotes actually correspond? Benjamin Simpson said, hi, good to be able to spend time uh, being from RJ. <laughs> um, this, um, one that um, the problem with Jensen's model is there isn't one. There's no real coherent notion of what it means to have a dispersal from Noah's Ark, which is the model that's lurking in the background with Nathaniel Jensen. So at one point in this chapter, he's got a quote, and I'll be putting the whole text of it up in the description once uh, the show hits the pan. Uh, like the flightless birds, a single population of great apes likely migrated to each continent. A single population of orangutans into Asia and a single population of gorillas into Africa. 
Subsequently, these separate populations diversified into the four species observable today. Inheritance from a common ancestor rather than four independent migrations is the more likely explanation for the resemblance among species on the same continent. This is um, a charming and backhanded way to summarize what he's really talking about, which is Noah's Ark lands on Ararat and the kinds that are on board the Ark disperse from Ararat going into Africa and Asia. Isn't that sweet? Does that fit the data at all? Well, what information does he offer in documentation for this extraordinary thing? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. No footnotes, no references, no citations, nothing whatsoever. And just some maps showing the current distribution of those organisms, not anything about the fossil record of them at all. Anyway, Joel Duff, who um, if you uh, don't follow him on um, his uh, uh, series, the uh, natural historian uh, dot com, he's uh, done a, a wonderful posts on things. Um, he had a post back uh, um, earlier in the year, last year, uh, on um, very similar notion about the distribution of the primates that was being presented in the new display at the Creation Museum. And uh, I, I'll be putting a whole quote up on there because it says it way better than I could. A last observation would be that the display is centered around external morphology and anatomy. They spend time trying to show how color and hair differences are easily changed to produce different types of apes. What is not mentioned, at least that I've seen so far, is the tremendous genetic differences between gorillas, chimps, and orangutans. The differences are not trivial. The differences even between two species of chimpanzee dwarf the differences between all human beings, even including Neanderthals. For two individuals to have spawned such large morphological and genetic differences in the space of a few hundred years, time from flood to ice age by the Creation Museum's reckoning, is a pace of evolution that would shock any evolutionary biologists. It has no basis in any evidence collected from the natural world, nor does the Bible provide evidence for such radical change of God's creation. Which I suppose is why Jensen didn't offer any evidence for it, because it would be impossible for him to do. Uh, Lisa says, yes, don't forget the kangaroos hopped a ride on volcano, volcano explosion and the koalas <laughs> being shot ballistically. To be fair, Creation Ministries International only offered that for a little brief period, at which point they were pointed out that it was such complete claptrap that they stopped talking about it. But nonetheless, they gave it a whack. Um, this is the thing that is so exasperating for creationists, and Jensen is in that field of somebody that has a model and it's all hide the ball. I am happy to see maps of distribution of orangutans and uh, African apes and so forth and so on, but I'd also like to see a map of the pre-flood world and a during the flood world and a post-flood world and an awareness of the paleontological and genetic information for all those organisms. And of course, it's way be beyond just the examples he's giving because we're talking about human beings, we're talking about food crops, we're talking about the, um, the Native Americans in the New World with potatoes and uh, corn and uh, uh, tomatoes and uh, all of the various um, crops that are utterly unknown in the old world. Where did they come from? Were not they all destroyed during the flood? You know, there's just way too much they need to account for. Um, and as a slate says, oh yeah, I've ignored American politics as I've been busy with buying a car and caravan, but it makes sense. Well, now I think you'll discover that you'll be able to ignore American politics a little more easily because we don't have a deranged ignoramus as president of the United States anymore. And they're going to actually kind of do stuff. So um, we're moving on. Meanwhile, we'll find out what um, uh, Donald Trump does down in Mar-a-Lago, whether he's just going to fester for a while and whether or not he's going to be impeached again. And that's just a whole bunch of political issues. But anyway, back to the fun stuff of science. Um, I expect creationists, and hear that, standing for truth, and Nephilim Free, and Raw Matt, and everybody else in your brain trust, go right ahead and work out your paleogeography. What did the world look like before the flood, based on what evidence? 
How do you account for all the material if you have a pre-flood basement rock and then you have a flood event that's happening and then you have like post-flood cataclysms? We'll be getting more to that in just a moment. You need to deal with it. Um, I, I'll be putting in some technical papers uh, that relate directly to humans, chimps, orangutan, divergence times, uh, um, paleontology relations and others. There's a paper from 2011 by Holbolt et al. Uh, that uh, I'll uh, be putting in as a full link. Then there's a, a 2016 paper by Cato et al., which offers brand new paleontological evidence on the gorilla human split. Ah, well, Elizabeth Mitchell didn't like that at Answers in Genesis. So uh, she had a posting on that with a lengthy insert by Andrew Snelling, who, by the way, is not a paleontologist, remember. Uh, and uh, Ovesta says, let's not forget the slow moving sloths must have fallen out of the kangaroo pouches as they took the long way. Ah, that is an interesting hypothesis, which will make a very nice cartoon, but a very bad science paper. Anyway, um, Snelling weighed in on this issue of gorillas. Who quote? But at that time in the first decades after the flood, decades, there was still residual local catastrophism occurring the details of which he neglects to specify. So it is not surprising that some of those migrating gorillas got swept away in a local superstorm event in the Afar Rift Zone as a hurricane blew in from the Indian Ocean due to the warmer post-flood ocean waters to be rapidly buried in sediments and fossilized. Residual explosive volcanism must also have been occurring as evidenced by the Tephra beds. Uh, you can't squeeze all of that into too tight of a time frame. And that's, again, these just hilarious hand-waving here. The notion is that tidal waves and tephra beds that are occurring after the tidal wave, and where is the evidence for the tidal wave? Did we skip that part as to the indication that a tsunami was involved in burying these gorilla uh, fossils? No evidence has been offered for that. Mitchell didn't offer any of it. Snelling didn't offer any of it. They just hand wave it away. Well, if I can do cartoons uh, without actually bothering with the evidence, geez, how amazingly easy can we do absolutely everything? Okay, now the gorillas were brought down by the space aliens, and the space aliens move really quickly. So they landed, or or we could draw that silly woman that uh, uh, Logic was talking about on one of uh, um, his videos recently, there is a, a lady that is, does videos that insists that there are spiders on the moon, space telepathic teleporting spiders that have come down to earth and were holding Sasquatches in caves as prisoners. I'm not making this up. She's actually a part of this stuff. It's absolute Looney Tunes. Is that any worse than Andrew Snelling trying to offer this little weird not to blunt? Oh, Lisa for Truth, and what about the White Cliffs of Dover? Uh, besides being a wonderful song, oh, the White Cliffs of Dover, um, they're also Cretaceous shock, uh, which are little diatom critters that have filtered down that were in there back in the Cretaceous period. It's visible now, of course, because glacial runoffs and all of that have scoured what now has become the English Channel, uh, including some catastrophic. Uh, flooding fairly recently when um, glacial dams and that would break up and the North Sea um, uh, it extended down through that area. There's some geological data on that. We'll be putting all that into the rocks volume too. There's an awful lot of science material which popped along in the recent times. And anyway, that scours that stuff available away. All of that takes time. And the quicker you try to cram all that together in one time frame, you have to add up all of the temperature involved. So just the same problem that uh, Joel Duff is referring to regarding the amount of genetic and morphological variation that we can find among the primates, you've also got the problem of the physical burial of them and the environments that are reflected by them. That the environment when the gorillas were actually alive in those fossil contexts ain't the same as it is now. And we can track that very meticulously in the little things that are put down in the technical papers, which, by the way, the creationists tend to bypass with hand waving paragraphs like um, uh, Snelling does. But for somebody who has as much pedigree in the geological sciences as Snelling does, he's getting really worse as time goes on. 
it, it's getting more and more like Henry Morris kind of stuff, who was not a geologist. And for that matter, um, if you read uh, Don Morris, uh, Henry Morris's son, who is a geologist, he doesn't sound much more detailed. So why is it when they start presenting their arguments, they're never getting as specific and meticulous as you do when you actually read the technical arguments on the actual geology? Which, since I'll be putting the links up, you can go ahead and do that yourself. Go ahead and compare notes. Anyway, it's a nice way of dealing with the things. Um, let me see where we are. Okay, we're still plowing along in here. Uh, so anyway, part two of the show, which will be starting a little bit earlier. I would have loved to have had Eric in. I put a link in um, of, uh, because the primates are her field, but I guess she was uh, busy on things. And I think uh, Jackson is uh, busy doing his work, uh, actually working, working. Uh, so uh, we didn't get a guess. Uh, for today's show, but um, nonetheless, it would have been nice to draw over uh, some of the uh, paleontological information since paleoanthropology is her area, and so primates, um, we could have gotten a really good laugh out of that. Anyway, part two is the issue of Carl Baugh's poop, and as I mentioned very briefly at the beginning, uh, um, Standing for Truth, who has never met Twaddle that he didn't accept and present without ever fact checking it. And doctor, he was put up with this doctor raw mat, um, supposedly his PhD in divinity, divinity, I don't know from where. Um, they happened to uh, lob an image um, in a discussion um, on uh, this incredible Cretaceous fossil was discovered near Casper, Wyoming. It consists of two embroiled snakes caught in an engulfing cataclysm that preserved them entwined in battle, exclamation mark. The suddenness of the catastrophe and the rapid hardening of the material that encased them preserved astonishing details, end of quote. Well, that cute little slide tracked finally down to a 2019 Carl Bob video. I was able to locate what it referred to. And uh, I'll be putting the link up to that video because that's actually the primary source that they're riffing off of. And supposedly, uh, uh, he says, is he see a doctor like Kent Hovind? Uh, probably, <laughs> yeah. And uh, operating at about, a, at, if anything, less at a deep, less sophisticated level than Kent Hovind is. Um, Ramat is a very peculiar little character. Um, pompous, self-assured, and so little justification for it. Anyway, oh, hi, Stephen Bauman. Oh, finally bought Evolution Slam Dunk. I'm going to put that up as a thing so everybody can see that. Whoops. Wrong one. Come on. Where I, I want. There we go. That's the one I want to have. And yes, finally out Evolution Slam Dunk. That is the other book Boop. on the back shoulder over there. The one that I wrote before uh, The Rocks Were There with Jackson Lee, which is all about the reptile mammal transition and how creation is screwed up. And it's fabulous example of Becker evolution. I was very pleased that uh, paleontologist Christine Janis, who's a big major league mammal paleontologist, uh, was very impressed with it, quite unbeknownst to me, which I discovered. And so um, her very favorable review of the book that I brought her into doing on Amazon, I put as a quote on the back end of the rocks were there reminding everybody that um, uh, it's um, a valuable work. Between the two of those and then the third rock volume, when Jackson and I uh, do that one and all the other stuff, we're gradually building up a, um, a, a major field that will be covering so many of the issues of the scientific issues that are brought up in creationism and also the cultural ones, the whole notions about why there's religions and then branching out in future books, we'll be going after some of the weird um, uh, anti-vax bunch, the uh, people who are uh, going after COVID uh, um, vaccines and others. There's a whole long range of Looney Tunesism that actually affects people's lives adversely. And so all of that bad method stuff that you can see in my Troubles in Paradise project and then in relation specifically to a topic, the reptile mammal transition in Evolution Slam Dunk, and then applied to the Young Earth Creationism Answers in Genesis argument uh, and so forth and so on. It's the same mad method. And so it's just a matter of piecing all the pieces together and to try to have works that are extremely current and well-documented so that anybody and well 
easily read, but yet not aiming to simplify it, dumb it down for the regular people. Uh, no, we want to do both. We want to make it clear and understandable and witty, but also operating at a technical level that anybody up to and including college level is not going to uh, be worried about it. That They can go through there and say, okay, if we want to dive in and find out all the little legally details about this stuff, there it is. It's in the indexing. We can find uh, all the references we need and, and track all of those down and, and run with them and follow up on it. So, um, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, um, Lisa says there are channels about religion. Uh, I up interesting stuff. It's, it's, it's a matter that's intrinsically related to how we think about things, why we have beliefs at all, not just religious beliefs, but political beliefs, cultural beliefs, personal prejudices. There's a whole slew of things. So anybody that's really interested in why human beings do what they do as uh, just anthropologists had jolly well pay attention to that stuff because it's a big chunk of our behavior. Um, yeah, Lisa says, yes, uh, reading is hard. Uh, Steve Bauman says reading is hard these days, but in the audio books, I'd love, uh, it's, it's a laborious progress process to do that. I've tried to do a bit with the, um, oops, oh, there we go. Mm, um, no, no, wait a minute, that direction, up in the corner. Uh, Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, uh, although um, uh, I haven't been able to finish the recording and, and the processing on all of that because the person who was helping with it had a bunch of things that he had to work with his own life and, and none of this was involving money. Uh, so um, it, it has been stuck. But it's in principle, it would be nice to do. Science works are not as easily done in the form that I would have to radically rewrite the text to make it workable as an audio book. And it would be a long audio book. Um, it's different. You can do things with like um, brief history of time and works like that are relatively amenable to an audio book because they're not um, referencing technical material particularly. And so you can just read the, the content of it. But to try to figure out how to structure all the stuff, you probably have to have a reference bibliography that would be available to, as a downloadable PDF. You're not going to go reading through the information on primary sources. It's just not going to work. So there, it, it would be a, a challenging thing to do. And so I'll have to say, Steve, that at the moment, I can't figure out how to do that yet. So anybody out there that wants to cooperate uh, with that, that can handle uh, organizing and, and putting forward and actually getting to the point of selling. I, well, I've got the microphone to do it. Uh, the microphone that was um, uh, that we uh, gathered together as a um, service did a, um, uh, um, not quite a GoFundMe, but anyway, a, a fundraiser uh, so that he could get a, a microphone that would have the level needed to be able to record at the audio level that you needed to do for these sort of things. And then you would still be the context of constructing them in, in smooth formats and, and making them available on whatever platforms they're involved in. And so I'm not knowledgeable in that area. So anybody that does want to tackle that with me, I'm game for it. And um, for the science uh, books, that'll require some really big re rearranging, and I'm game to do that as well. Uh, but it was something that I don't think I can do just by myself. Uh, there's too many um, things to handle. Um, but anyway, the, the idea, Lisa, you bring up a very, very point so you don't have to start completely from scratch. The whole point about everything that I'm doing in the works that I've been assembling and what I try to assemble for the, my shows and what I think everybody that does media to do is to structure things to make it easy for other people to pick up on that. So if you are going to bring up any issues where there are um, uh, technical links that are not just um, abstracts, but actual full text material, but links up to that so people can follow them easily. Uh, Vesta asks, uh, uh, hundreds of how fast YECs think loose post flood straight had turned to rock, wondering why the loose sand in pyramids didn't turn to rock. Um, that's a really good question. And as far as I can tell, they don't really think about that. That even up at the Andrew Snelling, uh, Tim Clary, uh, Steve Austin level of professional geologists who are in the creationist field, they just kind of speak of lithification, hmm. that there's no real attempt to work out how does this slurry that's coming in in this cataclysmic flood harden into rock 
so quickly? What, what, how can that work? And if it can happen that quickly, how come you can't do that in the lab? Yes, you can make some kinds of fossiliferous material under a pressure cooker and various other ways in a laboratory, um, not turn it into a block of rock. And, um, and so it's not a matter that they have an ongoing issue here. It's that they just like not to think about it. And yet they need to do that. The, the, the spectacular example is the Grand Canyon. Because their whole argument is that um, the Grand Canyon is, the rock is laid down in the flood. And then afterwards, it turns into rock lickety split. And the river, or rather a, a lake upstream, which they have hoped to find, and it turns out they can't find any evidence for, that's yet all of their material where we alluded to that in the rocks were there. But they have really been falling apart in trying to figure out where this supposed post-flood uh, lake was located that supposedly drained down and cut the actual canyon. So the canyon cutting is actually after the flood, technically, in their kind of models. But that still begs the question, how do you turn a couple miles worth of gluck into rock <coughs> and smoothly stratified as well. Or worse with tiltings and various other things. Some of these things that clearly indicated that there was more time. It wasn't all laid down in a big slurry. And so um, uh, any attempt to try to pull that layer cake apart and figure out how did it get to be rock and how did the canyon get to carve in it and do that in a period of, of decades instead of millions of years yeah plus a big section shameless plug for uh, uh the rocks were there we've got a, a big section in there on the whole point about what it means to be an incised canyon and incised canyons are real easy to understand this is a thing that's well known in geology that water comes down to a level fine and dandy well if the difference between one of these and the other is shifting faster than the water can erode it, which can happen when uplifts are occurring, like the Columbia Plateau or, or the Colorado Plateau, or dropping the other side, which is what happened when the Mediterranean dried up for a while, about five million years ago. In either one of those cases, you get incised canyons. And there's a whole slew of them all around the basin of the Mediterranean. Most of the canyons are now underwater because the Mediterranean is refilled. Uh, and you find them in other, uh, ev almost everywhere along the ice sheets of um, the old um, uh, um, ice age times in the Northern Hemisphere, there are spots where there are glacial ice dams. And so there's not just the ones that occur down the Columbia River, but there's other ones in various other ocean areas. And going back even farther, there's also signs that the same process was taking place of, of uh, outflow of flooding uh, that would occur with um, uh, the glacial ice sheets that were in the uh, supercontinents, uh, Antarctica, uh, Australia, um, Africa, and all that were wedged together back in the Silurian, um, what, 300 million years ago, something like that. Um, same processes. And all of that supposedly is taking place really, really lickety split fast in the creationism frame. Um, is it funny how we can do everything God can't, but nothing God can? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, it's almost like gods are imaginary. Interestingly enough, gods um, are very constrained about what they tend to do. Uh, there's a line from um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that I've always loved where the Vogon spaceship hung in the sky in exactly the way bricks don't. And that reminds us that there are things we get used to in the world. So we, we get rain, we get floods, we get rain, uh, fire, we get firestorms, we get lightning bolts, we get occasional volcanic eruptions, occasional boloid impacts. I mean, these are things that a culture can kind of get an appreciation for. Objects floating, no. Heavy anvils suddenly floating up in the air. That's not something that ever happens unless a really big wind come along. And so 
We don't conceptualize those things, but gods could do that miracle. I've always thought, you know, if, if, if in the Exodus, when the, um, the troops are coming down with their chariot wheels and God puts this big fire wall up and then he disconnects it, you know, why didn't you just leave it up? That could have saved the, the rigmarole. It's kind of like he wanted the guys to come in and get drowned, I think. To see them all drowned, isn't that nice? But um, nobody needed to die. You didn't need to drown any of the soldiers. You think the poor little chariot drivers didn't have families and weeping kids and all the rest, you know, that are going to be disrupted, assuming any of that actually happened. Um, God could just lift all of the chariots up off the ground. Their wheels could be spinning. The horses would be sitting there going, what the hell's going on here? And they realize, uh-oh, we we're dealing with a God. They can do magic, miracles in exactly the way that never happens in the real world. Nobody ever sees the chariot lift up in the air with the horse attached and float there for a while. Nobody's going to make that happen because it defies gravity. It, it's impossible to do that. You can imagine a chariot and a wagon being picked up in a hurricane or a tornado and taken away, but there you can see it. You can see wind. But just levitation? Nah, doesn't happen. So it's interesting that um, gods often don't think about those they don't have that in their kit bag of miracles uh they think of you know you've got um plagues of locusts you've got uh yeah, insects popped up a lot as plagues uh they're a natural phenomenon so we get all that same kind of thing uh oh lisa brings up don't forget plants on antarctica not just the plants animals that we can tell that there was a time of course when antarctica wasn't a freeze bag and there were all sorts of critters living there. And back then, Antarctica was parked next to Australia. Australia had not moved off yet. And you still had access with South America. And so I think Africa had pulled away a bit, but it was still connected up with South America. And so there's a faunal interchange from dinosaur times down into Antarctica and across to Australia. And when they started finding these Gondwanan style dinosaurs, including ones when Africa was even closer. Uh, in Australia, it dawned on them that the way they got there would have been through Antarctica. So they were predicting that there would be these dinosaur forms that existed in the intermediate spot. Spoiler alert, there were. And so when they began to work through all of the uh, paleogeography, it's made great sense. And they've been able to anticipate the critters and plants as well that are in Antarctica in that time frame. Later on, of course, as uh, ironically, as Australia moved farther and farther away from Antarctica, eventually it reached the stage when there was a circumpolar current that formed. And that threw the planet into a chill because the former warm waters that would be cycled all the way around Antarctica back up into the thing before it could get around Australia, uh, now circle right around Antarctica. Plus, you had the formation of the Isthmus of Panama that kind of off North and, South, brought North and South America together and therefore disconnected the thermal gradients that were connecting up the Atlantic and Pacific. That was another warming component. Both of those shut off at around the same time, five million years ish or so ago. And so that's what helped trigger off the latest cycle of ice ages uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Anyway, a um, little bit of a little side area. Now that's yet more information that needs to be fiddled into um, the um, uh, creationist time frame on there. Anyway, uh, back to uh, Ramat and the, the, the Karl Bapu. Um, so he's got this um, video as usual, Carl Bob doesn't do documentation. So where in Casper, Wyoming, if you think that, that, that Armitage's Triceratops horn was bad documented, wait till you see Carl Bob. <laughs> this is, there's no of any documentary evidence as to where this was found, what strata it was found in so anybody can check on it, or for that matter, being able to look at it. Now, supposedly, Ba has been insisting Oh, this would be neat if we could put this under a CAT scan to see the details. And I go, yeah, that would be fun because we could determine whether or not this thing was a coprolite or the supposed intertwined snakes. And uh, given the fact that Carl Baugh has zero uh, paleontological skill, 
Uh, I'm not holding my breath that this thing is any more legit. He's got a, a supposed a human finger that's not a human finger. And, of course, the fake um, uh, human footprints from Paluxy that he's been pushing all these years. He's just a terrible goofball. And he's been a terrible goofball for 30-some-odd years or more. And he's been making videos, and he's got websites and all the rest. It's uh, uh, Oh, Vandalia it says, Lisa, for truth, you should be a guest on a show someday. Yes, we've always had a delightful time. I was just on um, uh, Vandalia's uh, uh, channel. Uh, we were talking about politics. Bum, bum, bum. And uh, Dapper Dino's been on there talking about dinosaurs and all the rest. It's uh, it's a nice, wonderful thing. And, and um, uh, Lamont has wonderful questions. And uh, it's uh, and they've got, of course, people in the live chat that can chit chat back and forth and all that. So it's just a great way uh, to do that. So set it up. Yes, you'll, you'll have a delightful time. Uh, because it's um, um, a good amount of thing to just basically jaw on various uh, specific topics and raise issues and, and explore. And so it's uh, and you'll, you'll have a fun time on it. And um, anyway, uh, my suspicion is I, I haven't seen diddly squat criticism of this uh, supposed fossilized snake uh, anywhere in the various uh, criticism things. So I think because it's relatively recent claim, 2019, uh, nobody's really paid much attention to it yet. Everybody's gotten bored enough with Carl Ball. He's really not a very active player on the field. He's still got his websites and the like, and he still does lectures knocking around in things. But, but he's an old part. He's older than I am. And so he's he's really a relatively minor player on this. He percolates in. I think he intersects with uh, um, uh, Enyart, Bob Enyart, and uh, a few others. But um, time is passing for that. So you get the newer generation, especially the little lower pip, pipsqueaks like Standing for Truth and Raw Matt, who scavenge around for hot tips. And uh, they'll just repeat this crap. So anyway, this will be a a, um, uh, a a wonderful time. Oh, I'm, um, I'll, I'll watch as I follow along. Uh, Twitter is a really handy platform to exchange information really conveniently. It's uh, very accessible. Uh, it allows old lazy parts like me to be able to process information and swing things back and forth and trade things with people, uh, put in the links and all that very easily. And I do it very rudimentary. But I'm able to follow an awful lot of people that way, and it's it gives me alerts about things very, very um, efficiently in a way that a lot of platforms where there's just a bunch of little boxes that are on subtopics and you have to scroll down through them a lot to be able to find stuff, whereas everything is in the order of appearance um, in uh, that. So uh, it's I found it actually a more convenient way to interconnect with people uh, than Facebook and some of these other platforms that other people use. So uh, it costs you nothing. Uh, so all you got to do is to set up a thing. And even if you don't use it a lot, you can still use it as ways to communicate with people. There are little side chat areas where you aren't public. So you can convey information back and forth in little groups that where you have to be membership only. And um, uh, uh, Vandalia is one of those that's on the little subsections in there. So you can put links back and forth and all that kind of stuff. Very, very conveniently. So, it, and it's real easy to do for when you're doing video chats because then you can just put the, the join link right there on Twitter and you don't have to send them an email. You don't have to go around that. It, with me, it's a pain in the ass if somebody uh, invites me to do something on the email because then I have to open up my email account and all of that. Whereas if, if it's on Twitter, I can just go bloop and uh, much, much faster. So, so there we go. And um, uh, old man, has RJ come out of his cave? <laughs> I have never been in a cave. Uh, I, uh, I'm out all the time. Um, logical, possible, probable. Yes, indeed. Um, I, as anybody that knows me um, knows that there's an awful lot of stuff that goes on when I'm not on camera or, for that matter, online. And I'm very busy with all the different projects and things that I deal with. And uh, um, because uh, mine is a scholarly pursuit, I'm looking at the incoming data field of two forms. So a reminder of what I do on this thing. The reason why I say this, this is one tiny niche, the, the evolution hour. That's just a weekly thing. In books like, oops, there we go, 
uh, our output at, in addition to it, but also it's the surge of the information. One is keeping track of what creationists say. And it's not just the owner of creation that's that, it's also intelligent design and that much more minor league old earth creationist bunch, which is basically Fazal Rana and Uras. Um, uh, and what information they present, what arguments they uh, are offering, and I'm funneling them that into uh, my uh, spreadsheet data field that keeps track of all of that. So at the moment, you know, uh, anti evolutionists have bumped into about 15,000 technical papers, uh, or no, uh, about 5,000 technical papers. And um, the, no, no, I can, no, it is closer to me. Um, and uh, that's a lot, but an awful lot of it is not um, ridiculously um, relevant. It's a lot of authority quotes. It's a lot of older material that, they, as Nathaniel Jensen demonstrates, just because you cite a technical paper doesn't mean you're citing it accurately. We're going to be getting into some stuff in the next um, episodes where you have to go, why did you bring this up? This was really not an issue which you should have brought it up. Um, and then I'm dealing with the incoming technical field. So later on in the night, I'm going to be uh, tackling the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which comes out fresh every Tuesday. And so I typically tackle it on Wednesday uh, evening after I have uh, done Evolution Hour. And um, uh, science and nature and others, and then all the various technical material that comes my way that I find about from my various contacts uh, on social media and uh, um, the incoming technical literature that is being brought up by people in the field where they're saying, oh, look at this new work. It's really important. Uh, so I, and uh, occasional video lectures that pop up because a, a good video lecture by a scientist, there was one that I just saw it's five years old, but still very relevant uh, from Eric Smith on the um, metabolic system in prebiotic biology and its relation to the Krebs cycle. How does that one for a title? Uh, that's not what he called it. That's what it was about. And um, that the realization that the chemical systems that are involved in the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, that in animals runs one direction, in the organisms and the chemistry event systems um, runs the opposite direction. And that opposite direction runs energetically downhill, which means it produces the components of biology automatically and inevitably. It's thermodynamically impossible for it not to do that. It's exactly the opposite of the citric cycle, the, the, the way the, we run it in reverse. And what is interesting is that the evolved biological systems developed a form of the citric acid cycle that runs backwards from the way it does in vents. And that produced a different way of running information or just, um, um, uh, electron flow uh, that makes for very interesting stuff in photosynthesis and a whole bunch of other processes that, that uh, run as energy cycles in advanced organisms. But before life began, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so it, it's, a, it's yet another step in working out what was going on in uh, uh, the prebiotic environment as to what goes on in the chemical cycles, quite independently of living systems. Oh, uh, oh, we got, oh Neil's in here. Brain bug. Hi, brain. How's your bugs doing? At, um, uh, he was uh, the very first living organism that was a guest on the new format of Evolution Hour when we were on um started up on the laptop and so that demonstrated that we were able to do that and um <laughs> i said look uh, i love the uh a butterfly in the uh, thumb on your last uh, bit i i must uh, bow to those who can do the, the neat photography uh, and a really good photographer and or graphic artist um is a really wonderful skill set i wish i had um jackson even though he's not a graphic artist is way better at picking and integrating imagery into his videos as you can see this is just a talking head and uh um I, i'm not in a position on the laptop at the moment to put much stuff up oh i suppose however i should prep for uh my um shameless plug um, there we go. Let's get our little thing going here for the rocks were there wall we got going. I sometimes forget to do that, I must confess. Let me put in here. 
a screen on here. I'll add that on there. And we'll I'll let that run then whilst um, I am talking. There we go. Um, whoops. There we go. It's uh, uh, That's our advertisement that uh, Peter did up for our uh, book, The Rocks Were There, on the Answers in Genesis works. And uh, that's volume one, available. It's a big, thick thing. Um, well documented and indexed. It's also rip snortingly funny because creation is doing an awful lot of amazingly stupid things. There we go. Whoop. And um, uh, the link to that, as always, is at um, uh, in the description. So anybody can look at it that way. You can also, once you're on Amazon, you can also find uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, and I got the link on that. On that, if you like the fixin', you can also get the uh, Paralogs of Phileas Fog. And I'm just writing up the big climax sequence of the second Paralogs of Fog novel. So there's uh, there will be fiction for people as well. And um, uh, I hope that, that we can all build up a really neat network. Uh, and I'm never frustrated at the fact that there are other people that they put shows on at the same time I'm on. You know, there's, there's the, the more people that are involved on social media, the odds are that every hour of the day there's going to be something. So everybody's going to overlap everybody else. But the advantage of it is you don't have to watch everything all at once. So people can watch my show when they wish it not necessarily live and likewise i can do the same thing with all the various other people that i can pick up on and then you can triage to pick up what information you want to um, follow up on to build up your own network of understanding so that when you do bump into people who believe claptrap um you are well armed and are confident enough to um respond to them uh you can be drolly sarcastic as ian chen oh little scamp ian chen was absolutely hilarious in his um uh, debate with nephilim free who stamped off in a fit and never actually even presented his side of things because uh, but the, the ian was just hilarious in his parody of uh, an awful lot of creationists even down to wearing a flowered shirt like Kent Hovind. i mean it was it was just just delicious um Oh, Elisa says I use Adobe Spark. Um, yeah, there's a lot of software things that I probably should get more knowledgeable about. Um, in principle, someday I'd love to have um, a partner uh, to be able to work on that, to, to timeshare the skills to be able to do stuff that way. And also, eventually, there's going to need to be somebody to pick up where I'm leaving off on the, um, the Troubles in Paradise research project. I don't want it to stop when I'm gone. Uh, and so uh, eventually, somebody or out there needs to be able to help pick up the slack and continue all of that. It doesn't have to be a single person. It could be a team of people. But, but people who are um, sufficiently energized and, and motivated and curious to be able to proceed and know the ropes of source methods and why I look into the various issues and things that I do and document what I can do uh, to try to build up as big of a data field that we can and to share it as efficiently as possible. One advantage of having a, a physical hard copy book is that then you can carry that around with you in a way that you may be able to find information and bookmark it in ways that sometimes can be awkward in for electronics and not everybody still thinks that way in terms of stuff that you can latch off off your uh, uh um, your kindle reader uh Rainback says uh, uh that secular cosmologists agree with this claim that the singularity was the start of the universe yeah the, the nature of everybody should always be careful about thinking about the initial events of things with the big bang it's that um, singularity is a peculiar physics phenomenon that's taking place at the beginning of stuff. But basically, that's the time when all the physics goes tilt. Formulas don't mean anything. You, it, you're just eh. um, so you're getting uh, this does not compute, and you can work out hypothetical physics to 
to ponder what might have been happening before the beginning of space time. And physics can play around, physicists can play around with very sophisticated thinking that way. But push comes to shove, it's all trying to think about stuff before our observations. But we still got stuff up to the observations part. So by that, you know, I don't think there's any serious dispute anywhere in the modern cosmological community for like from the Big Bang out to a boundary layer of like about a millionth of a second. And from that point on, it's all settled, it's all done. You pretty well understand all of that stuff after that. So things that eventually, uh, the, the temperature, the universe is expanding and, and things are cooling down, the forces are pulling apart. Uh, so the various forces of nature, the, um, uh, the electroweak force, uh, electromagnetism and, mag and the weak nuclear force, which merges as a single force at high energy. And then the strong nuclear force that holds atoms together, that merges at a higher energy level. And gravity merges at the highest level. And one of the reasons why studying gravity is so tricky is because since the Big Bang, we really haven't had conditions that allow you to pull and squeeze the forces together. We can't build particle accelerators that sophisticated. Uh, once you get before Planck time, it is just plain strange. That pretty well sums it up. Uh, that um, and and the universe is not obliged to be tidy on our behalf, uh, but nonetheless, uh, anybody that tries to poke at the singularity side and the beginnings of the universe as a way to pretend that like we don't have a pretty good idea of what happened after that. Sorry, it ain't gonna work. And anybody that attempts to slip in a really constrained time frame, well, if, okay, you say there's 13.8 billion years, and I say it's 6,000 years, well, that's just a couple of days. I mean, who's gonna divide over it? It makes a gigantic difference. That, uh, and, and any attempt to cram all that stuff into a shorter time frame has consequences for the physics has consequences for energy dispersal and heat and light traveling and a whole bunch of stuff. It's an utter, utterly mess. Uh, oh, uh, we got a, a Spark Adobe on there. Uh, and uh, I, I shall have to write that down and that because I'm going to be doing all of my little things mainly on other computers. So we might want to keep that. I will look that up and to see what all I need here. I don't even have a word processor and stuff on this laptop yet. And uh, so there's a bunch of things that I would like to be able to do on the fly and have not been able to do that yet myself, that one way or another. Uh, so many things that I worry about that I need to get ahead of that, including a garage door repair and car servicing and all the little fiddly bits and things. So anyway, uh, we'll see how all that goes. Anyway, yeah, heat. Um, that equal mc square thing radioactive decay there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on there and so anybody that tries to to wriggle around that plus you can just be snarky and say okay you don't like the big bang we look forward to your monograph on that subject and after you passed it around the physics community and you got all those physicists going hey now you got it right then get back to us okay until you've done that though uh why are we listening to you because we're going to pay still attention to the actual uh, cosmologists that are doing the work and have the students and uh, make use of the telescopes and all the little uh, uh, funky little formulas and that that actually work and do stuff so um there we got a a, a, a circumstance of it uh oh this uh, uh, why the prime mover argument is bunk from the gate no order of operation before Planck like time yes the um um the whole uh uncaused cause prime mover argument and you find this in the kalam uh k-l-a-m um uh cosmology argument this is the latest squiggle of this uh d james or not or um oh yikes uh i've suddenly forgot the name of the guy um brain fart um Give those dire wolves a shout out, RJ. Oh, we were having a brain bug and I were giving a talk. He, he, he was putting up some information earlier on Twitter about dire wolves. And there's some argument that they may not be wolves after all. And I says, well, how do we know they were so dire either? 
And uh, there we go. Um, th th there are a good reminder, though, of how immensely varied uh, the Pleistocene world was, uh, how many critters were knocking on that have uh, um, checked out in just the last 10,000 years, uh, some of which may be due to environmental stress uh, from the uh, breakdown of the Ice Age ecosystem. And also some of it comes from the fact that the new counter on the scene, human beings, um, contributed to things. I think it, it's a complex mix. The usual cliche was that human beings uh, mega hunted everything to death. And I think it's more complicated than that in some areas. Uh, I, I do know that the studies that I've seen on mastodons are uh, either mastodons or mammoths. But because they're elephants, they have relatively long breeding times. and um, of relatively few kids. So all you need is to pick off the youngest because they're the smallest and slowest. And that can cut down the population mix sufficiently with the climate stress that it can suddenly collapse the population. And that's why they disappear. So um, yeah, the, the Callum thing, God, what the hell's his name? Uh, it's got a, it's three, three names uh, together. Um, he's a pompous a master of the circular argument. And he's one of the big pushers. Uh, I suppose I should. I've got my bibliography open on my on my. Let me look up the column and see if I can think of how that is. Yes. I kick myself the moment I see him. Um, oh, I think it's because that's got. Um, Got a stupid uh, um, weird letter or something. And I'll have to figure it later on. It's just driving me nuts. Anyway, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, tornado. And you I'm not mistaken. Most of the men with the earth shattering to boom. Oh, don't get me going on uh, on Marvin the Martian there. <laughs> Illudium Q36 explosive space modulator. Um, everybody should, that should be part of our cultural heritage. Everyone should have seen all the Marvin the Martian cartoons uh, that were done. Uh, one with Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century. Oh, will we stop that stupid all Windows 10 updates? Good Lord, stop that. Okay. What to do? Okay, so I'm just about out to the end of the hour since the computer is screaming. Uh, for me to do updates in that. Uh, anybody got any last minute questions on here uh, for um, uh, the show before I pull the plug on it? If not, uh, everybody stay uh, careful. We still got uh, a bit of. Ian Lane Craig, thank you, Slade. There we go. I knew I could. Um, mental block on here. Come on. There we go. There we go. William Lane Craig. He is the um, um, very the, the great master of the circular argument, who will argue that morality proves the existence of God and God proves the existence of morality. And there we go. Isn't that nice? Um, he's very self-satisfied. Um, that um, a weird argument to go from um, orangutans to uh, Karl Bapup to uh, cosmological issues, but they all interconnect eventually. Um, uh, William Lane Craig, I will point out for those who are, aren't aware of him, comes from that intelligent design, old earth creationist framework, not young earth creationists. In fact, an awful lot of the arguments that you try to use for Kalam style uh, presuppositional jujitsu physics um, won't work if the universe doesn't have the standard physics it does. And so anybody that's trying to do that and not have the Big Bang hovering in the corner, uh, young Earth creationists have to kind of end run and develop an entirely independent argument, and they don't make use of that. But anyway, that covers most of the thing. Um, I hope you enjoy the show uh, on here, and everybody stay safe. Don't accept any wooden penguins. Uh, if you can become a, a patron to the project, please do so. Uh, don't forget all the books and all that. And let everybody know about uh, what we're doing here and what is important. And if the last couple of years have not made it abundantly clear, people with dangerously bad methods should not be in positions of power. It's not good. 
they screw everything up. And so we have to minimize that for our own safety. And so the world goes on and we can continue to do smart things and make wonderful stuff like spaceships and all that. Okay, bye-bye, everybody, and see you next week.